Okay, so longevity risk regulation around the world, and I guess that makes sense. I'm from the International Monetary Fund, so we take a very global perspective of these things. Um, I have to give the standard disclaimer here that these are my opinions only and not the IMFs or IMF boards. Um, the, what I'm going to discuss today kind of goes back some years, goes back to actually, uh, it goes back even further than this, but in terms of published work, goes back to April 2012, and we published a chapter in the IMF uh, Global Financial Stability Report on longevity risk transfer markets, and that mainly means the transfer of, of, of longevity risk from defined benefit plans um, to the insurance sector. Um, in fact, I, I presented that paper here, I think, that, that year. So um, Then that was followed up um, by another, another project with the Joint Forum. The Joint Forum is kind of a, for those of you who don't know, is a sort of a global mega body of the, uh, that comprised, uh, is comprised of the insurance, securities, and banking regulators, so the people that write the Basel Accord would be part of this group. Um, and so we did a report on, on the regulatory aspects of longevity risk transfer markets. But, you know, after doing all this work, we're left with some puzzles. Um, and, and the main one was um, why we, were, we looked around the world and we saw there were vibrant uh, markets in some countries and not in others. So being a regulatory mindset, we thought, well, maybe it's because the regulatory playing fields are not, not even between the pension and insurance sectors in different countries. Um, so then we, uh, that, that spawned the, the, this project I'm working on here, which is definitely a work in progress. It's turned out to be a lot harder than, a, than I thought it would be when I told Olivia that I would take this on last year, much harder. Um, but here's an overview of what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to just start with a brief introduction of longevity risk math markets and, and what drives um, these, um, these, these longevity risk transfer markets. And then, then, then we'll go through some of the longevity risk regulations in selected countries, um, focusing mainly on mortality assumptions and, and, um, solve, and liability discount rates. And the focus here, when I'm talking about um, mortality assumptions and discount rates, is on the solvency liability. There's, as we heard this morning, there's different um, lenses you can look at liabilities through, but we're focusing on the solvency um, liability that, uh, that regulators be looking at to make sure the pension funds are properly funded. And uh, so then we try to look for links between levels of these regulatory playing fields and longevity risk transfer market activity. And then I, f I end with a, just a brief discussion, the rationale for leveling the playing field or, or not leveling it. And we've heard perspectives on all of these things in earlier sessions. Oops, too far. So first of all, just to put it in perspective, longevity risk is obviously a big factor, a big, a big risk. Um, this shows that for every year, uh, the blue bars show the, the, the effect of one year of lifespan increment um, on pension liabilities. So at the kind of zero rates we're seeing today, obviously, it's, it's a pretty big deal. It's a 5% it's increase in liabilities for a one year um, increment in lifespan. And, and when you look back in history, um, about every 10 years, longevity risk assumptions go up by about one, one year from the, and I'm always marking my longevity risk assumptions from the 65-year-old point, which is the typical retirement age. Um, and this chart shows that, and it just keeps going up and up. And every time it goes up, people say, well, you know, this is it. it we'll, we'll lock our assumptions in here next year. You know, you know, it's, it's a, we see another increment. So it seems to be um, something that's um, going to be continuing to, to be on our minds. And so in order to deal with longevity risk, um, defined benefit plans take a number of different approaches. Some of them close down their, their their DB plants new employees. Um, some of them um, are closed down to, to the accruals to existing employees. Um, and another common approach that shows up in this bar chart here is that, that they're converting their defined benefit plans into defined contribution plans. So that, that's, that's one way, and probably a very popular way of dealing with longevity risk. Um, but a, another way that's catching, catching some momentum here are the are longevity risk transfer markets. Um, and these take the form of buy-ins and buy-outs, and those are the kind of, um, kind of transactions that uh, um, Amy Kessler deals in every day. We heard from her this, more, her this morning. That that's, uh, that's her bread and butter. And uh, also swaps and insurance contracts are another way that longevity risk and pension risk is being transferred from pension funds, DB pension funds, to, to the insurance sector. And so you see that, you know, it's a pretty big and growing market, and some people look at this market and these trends and say, um, well, this is about the same point that OTC derivative markets were at back in the 90s. So um, 
there could be potentially some pretty big growth to come. We'll see. Oops. And I'm jumping around here. Okay. And then the, 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 those are UK markets I showed you there, and you can see that that's not just a UK only thing. That uh, in fact it's a pretty big, um, pretty big market elsewhere in in the world, including the US. And then. In terms of countries, you can see the, the major markets are in the Netherlands, the UK, Canada, and the US. And, and what I've did in this chart to sort of try to find out where I expect to see this activity, I've got defined benefit plans um, as a percent of all, and these are private sector plans, by the way. So for instance, Netherlands, 95% of all plans are DB. Um, and then I've got another column here for percent of GDP taken up by the different, uh, um, the, the the plan, so just to put it in perspective, 166, the, the, the total number, the total amount of defined benefit plans in the Netherlands is about 166% of GDP. So I multiply these two together to get kind of an intensity variable, which um, gives me an indication of, of um, where I might expect to see longevity risk mark, um, transfer activity. For instance, you go down to the bottom and you see Brazil, 6% of their plans are DB and total plans are only 13% of GDP, so this intensity number is 1%. I don't expect um, Amy and her gang to be going to Brazil looking for business, but I do expect her to be in the Netherlands, the UK, Canada, and the US, and, and Switzerland, and maybe Japan. So I wonder, you know, this is where the question comes in, why is it that we see all this activity in the Netherlands, UK, Canada, and the US, and not so much in Switzerland and Japan? So we go off in pursuit of the answer. <clears throat> and those numbers may seem big. You see numbers in the 50 billion size or whatever in the UK, but actually the, the total amount of defined benefit longevity risk out there has been said to be in the 20 to 30 trillion. So the market's potentially massive. So that's why we wonder what might be impeding market growth. Um, could be reinsurance longevity risk capacity constraints. I don't think we're anywhere near that right now. I think from one my conversations with insurers, there's a lot more room to go there. Um, they, and reinsurers have a natural, um, a natural appetite for the life insurance and uh, life reinsurers have a natural appetite for this longevity risk to offset the mortality risk they have in their life insurance books. Um, maybe pension funds are not required to fully recognize and deal with um, longevity risk. Maybe hedge funds are not fully rewarded by regulators and credit rating agencies, and that's that's a possibility. Um, we saw some a, a paper presented this morning that, that suggests that maybe um, the markets don't fully measure the ups and downs in in um, in the surpluses and deficits. That could be a case, but um, the one we're focusing on here is pension funds. Maybe they're given more flexibility than insurers on mortality projections and discount rates. And just uh, as an add-on here, I mean, these are other factors too. Market risk tends to attract a lot more attention because it's, as a pension sponsor, it's more on your face, especially if you've got a lot of equities in your portfolio. That's whips on your surplus and deficit around quite dramatically. And another um, and reason, and this, we, we done, the World Bank did some work in Chile on a potential longevity risk bond, and they, they found that moral hazard was the issue there, that everyone just assumes the government's going to bail um, these pension plans out. So, um, in terms of the, the 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 variables that we're focusing on, you know, first of all, appropriate funding levels are generally determined by the discounted present values of the expected future payments. That's pretty obvious, um, and, and it's also pretty obvious that regulators are going to demand that the most accurate, um, best uh, estimate mortality projections are used. But we'll see later. There's a lot of variability there. But for discount rates, you tend to be there tends to be more variability. Um, you go from risk-free rates, which are often government bond yields, plus a spread um, to reflect liquidity risk, and interest rate swap curves are often used there. Um, or you might use corporate bond yields or expected um, asset rates of return. Um, and they, these are all going from sort of low to, to high. Um, that's a possible. So the next, next, next part of our project, because at that point I thought this is going to be pretty, pretty easy, that we can go out there and collect for different countries um, all these mortality assumptions and discount rates. But the first stumbling block you run into is that, unlike in the banking sector, um, you don't have global agreed to standards for insurance and pension fund regulation. Insurance, um, maybe we're moving gradually in that direction, but pension funds, um, um, we're probably a decade or more away from some kind of um, standard, a global standard that we could look to, to to guide this kind of work. Um, 
and of course, and even within countries, um, you have the you have a, a different regulators by state or province or or, or uh, canton in, in the case of Switzerland. Um, so that makes it very difficult to say, okay, I'm going to go seek out the Swiss rules for um, for pension funds and insurance, and and then it's all it's very fragmented. Um, and so, but nevertheless, back in 2013, um, in our joint forum project, we we sort of got the sense that uh, many countries, it was the fact that pension funds got a slightly easier ride on these variables, but we never really put any any meat into that assumption. So that's what I'm trying to do here. So um, just to start with, this table just shows the, um, the different mortality table and discount rate required by regulation. You can see that there's no hard lines here. Most Many countries um, don't, um, don't actually set um, hard standards for any of these things. So um, again, that's just sort of um, points to the difficulty of what we're trying to do here. Um, but we did try anyways, and so we collected for various countries, and you'll see blanks in there because we're still working on, on some of those, but these are the mortality curve assumptions used in different countries. And in brackets, we've got these shortfalls, and these are shortfalls that were measured um, as part of an OECD project where they tried to estimate um, the effect on the liability um, of using different these curves versus what they felt to be an ideal um, curve. And so I've highlighted here um, four countries, and these are the four countries where they found that the mortality assumptions being used in those countries were easier for defined benefit plans than, than insurers. So we have Canada, Japan, the United States, and Switzerland. So you know this starts to build a, the case here that the, the, this could be a friction in some of these countries. Um, um, particularly we saw Japan, we saw earlier in that uh, earlier slide that Japan was one where we expect to see a lot of activity, but we're not. Um, so the, um, the next one, we get into the discount rates, and same, same theme here, the highlighted um, countries are the ones where they have slightly easier um, assumptions on the, um, on the discount rates. So you see Switzerland, they allow um, defined benefit plans to use rate of return on assets, um, whereas the insurers there are using government bond yields. So just, just in terms of sources, in, in many cases, it was really just uh, Googling around, poking around different regulatory sites and, uh, and so on. So even some of these things are still awaiting some um, confirmation. We, we, basically, the IMF, we have a, pro, a process where when we write something, we usually send it back to the country authorities to, to check them out. So some of these things still require some, some verification. But, but I have a fairly high degree in, of confidence in these ones here. Now, the UK is a bit different because the insurers, they are allowed to use rate of return on assets, whereas the um, defined um, benefit plans are using the gilts plus a spread. So I, there you could see a reversal. And I wonder, um, I'm, I still have to verify this, but I wonder whether this could be like the accelerator pedal um, on the, the amount of business that you see being done in, in the UK. And, and I've got a second version of the chart here where I've got the the same numbers as the, the previous one, but I've got the post-solvency two rules, and you can see that in the case of the UK, um, it becomes a bit more, perhaps more even. So we'll, it's kind of interesting to see in 2016 when we get solvency two, whether we might see a tailing off of the UK volumes of, of business. And we'll see, and there might be other drivers in, 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 in the UK that would keep it going. And just to put the, the, the spreads in perspective, the, this is for the U.S. I looked at 10-year treasuries, 10-year swaps, AAA corporates and BAA corporates, and you can see there's quite a spread between the low and the high. So we're talking about some pretty, pretty big differences between discount rates. I and mean, we're looking at a difference of about 250 basis points from treasuries to, to BAA corporates. So, and, and, and this chart shows that a 100 basis point jump or, or difference in, 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 in these rates can lead to quite, quite a big impact on the discounted pension liabilities. So you can see that, uh, and it depends on what your life expectancy is, but even just using 15 years, um, 100 basis point differential here translates to about 7.5%. Um, so it's, it's not small potatoes we're talking about here. So what might the rationales be for the different, different rate assumptions? Well, you know, one might be that... Uh, um, you, might, you might argue for the risk-free rate in that it's, it, we're, we're, we should be reflecting, we shouldn't be reflecting non-payment. So, you know, an alternative would be to use the, the, the rate of return or the cost of capital for the, um, the, the company that sponsors the pension 
plan um, so that if it's if it's uh, if it's uh, has a very low rate and it could be, have a very high high yield, but that seems to be kind of perverse in, in terms of the way you would be wanting to measure the risk of those pension liabilities. Or you could use um, the high highly liquid treasury securities, but that's not appropriate using treasuries without some kind of spread because um, the pension fund and an annuity provider doesn't really need um, to need that level of liquidity. Uh, and expect to, uh, asset returns seem prone to gain because the higher the return assumption, the lower the solvency liabilities. And there's some papers that uh, are out there that uh, uh, kind of go through some of the math to show that perhaps uh, that is the in, that would be a rather inappropriate rate to use. Um, so maybe the use of swap curves or government yields plus the liquidity spread. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of agnostic here, and I've, I'm even more agnostic after listening to this morning's sessions. I'm tempted to think that go back to the drawing board and rethink my personal thoughts on what what rate might be appropriate. But uh, I'm, my job here is just to collect the data, and uh, that's that's. Uh, that's what I'll continue to do. And so just going back to our, our chart here, um, we can see that it's Switzerland, and I should have added Japan here. We might explain the lack of activity there um, um, because they have this, the, slight, the pension funds have the slightly slacker mortality assumptions um, and use expected asset returns as a discount rate. I've talked to Amy Kessler about some of these things because she, she's working where the rubber hits the road. And there might be some other factors at play here. For instance, perhaps, um, she told me that Switzerland, in Switzerland, um, a lot of the funds there have, um, they're running very deep deficits. And when you run a deep deficit and you want to do a deal with an insurance company, the first thing you got to do is basically make up that deficit. Then no one's going to do a transaction in, with you until you do that. So um, that could be holding things things back there. And that, that may be also um, what might be holding the U.S. market back from, from you know, even higher volumes of activity. Japan, though, is a complete mystery, I must admit, right now. I've got an answer for that one. Also, in the U.S., we're starting to see a pickup in activity because we've got this recent change um, to the, the mortality assumptions, the, the R, I'm probably going to get this wrong, RP 2014, I believe. And so that, that could be kind of scaring some companies into, into um, laying off some of their risk. So um, last slide here, rationale for favor in pension fund sector. Well, you know, there's good reasons you might want to do it. Um, policy makers may want to encourage corporates to provide DB plans to their, their, their employees. So if you make it too tough on them, they're not going to do it. They're all going to be doing DC. Um, maybe um, this is a more mathematical um, rationale. DB plans um, sponsor, uh, sponsors provide an extra layer of shortfall protection versus a single layer offered by insurers. The ins an annuity from insurers backed basically by the whole company Whereas with a DB plan, you're backed by the assets that the DB plan owns, and then you've got this extra sort of um, you've got this extra sort of call option, I guess, on on the firm if if the, if there's a shortfall on the on the assets. Um, but then on the other hand, there's a paper that I'm working on with a couple of colleagues that suggests sponsors of underfunded plans uh, will make use of any regulatory leniency they give them. We find the underfunded plans are, um, are often using the, the, the you know, they're stretching basically the limits of what they can do on the discount rates. Um, in any case, well, this comes out of the joint forum project too, that these, the rationale should be made more explicit. And that's, uh, and that, and that's why you know, we shouldn't have the discussions like we have this morning wondering why this, why they do this, which, which liability is the right one. Um, policymakers should be out front basically saying this is how it should be and this is why. Thank you.